Hey, check out this fancy little uh, pencil sharpener that my wife got me for my birthday. It's like a wood plane, but for pencils. It's pretty heavy. These are the blades. <laughs> Look at that little guy. Hey, welcome to the Fireside. My name is Jake. So happy to have you back here with me today for this second installment of our um, newest series on illustrative style tattooing or more specifically like storytelling through tattoos. And so what I've done, if you didn't catch the first episode with Nick Baxter, uh, is reach out to some of my favorite illustrative style tattooers just to kind of pick their brains on what their processes are, their thought processes and their working processes whenever they're creating these kind of um, narratives in their in their tattoos and their designs. And today's episode is super exciting because it's with one of my favorite large scale illustrative style tattooers, uh, Teresa Sharp. Teresa has been on the show once before. It's been a few years back. We caught up with her at a convention, I believe in Phoenix, Hell City Phoenix a few years back, and I really, really enjoyed that episode, and so did you guys. We got a ton of feedback on, on that episode. She's very personable, she's really an incredible artist, very personable, uh, easy to talk to. You don't even really need me in this episode. She just kind of carries it all the way through. So one thing that Teresa has started doing since our last conversation, since the last time she was on the show, is that she is actually creating her own concepts, her own ideas, and then selling those ideas as tattoos to her clients rather than the traditional process of a client coming in for a consultation with an idea and you're interpreting their idea. She's kind of put uh, put out the work that she would like to do and then is finding clients that are a good fit for that. So we talk a good bit about that in this episode. So let's go ahead and get into the episode. I want to thank Teresa so much for taking the time to participate in this project. I got a lot out of the episode and I hope that you will too. Don't forget, if you do like it, to thumb us up. That's really important, so I hear. So we'll see you guys at the end of the episode. One of the reasons that I thought of you early on is because you're one of the few people that I know of that stopped involving the client in the creative process early on. So like you're, you started creating the designs and selling the designs as tattoos. And so I, I thought, oh, that'll be kind of a different perspective. So maybe let's just start with that. I don't think you were doing that the last time that we podcasted. If you were, I didn't know about it. No, uh, I think I was. You were? I, no, I don't think so. I oh, think okay. that came after last time we had talked. Um, I was still, like, I think at that point I was able to kind of pick and choose my projects, but I hadn't switched over to fully like leaving a list of here's what I want to do. And then just letting people kind of come to me that already have those desires. Um, so yeah, that was, that's kind of been a new thing probably in the last like couple of years that I've really like really pushed into. Yeah. Yeah. So what, I mean, I know that there are some obvious reasons that you might do that. Uh, the, anyone that's been tattooing for any period of time would like to have more kind of creative control. Was that basically the main reason you just wanted, you had, or what, what, what made you think you could do it? And then what made you kind of take the jump into it? I mean, it's one of those things where you never know until you, until you ask and everybody's afraid to ask. In yeah. tattooing, a lot of tattooers are afraid that if, um, put themselves out there that, you know, people are either going to not want it or not care about it. Or, you know, there's like that ego that's attached to like your artwork and the fear of rejection, I think is, is strong in, in the tattoo world because we rely so heavily on clients. And, and you, when you come up in tattooing, like you have to prove that you can tattoo and they're good at it. And then you have, you have to work until you have enough people booking with you before you can even start saying no to stuff, you know? Cause it's like, when I started tattooing, I did everything. I did lettering, I did bio, I did, you know, tribal stuff, portraits, it didn't matter. I did whatever came in, whatever I thought I could do, I did it. And for, you know, like five years, I, I did that stuff. And then it was like, okay, you know, I have enough people knocking on my door. It's time to start like weeding out the projects that aren't interesting to me, stuff that just really doesn't capture me. And, it just kind of kept getting more and more weeded out. Like the more booked I got and the more people that were just waiting and waiting, waiting to get in with me, the more I was able to just be like, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to do that. And then it got to a point where I think this happens a lot in tattooing because somebody sees a tattoo and they go, Oh, that's a great idea. 
And so you get asked for that over and over and over again. And so people, I mean, and there's plenty of artists out there that are kind of like, you know, shoot into these like particular things that they do. It's like, oh, you're a flower person. You only do flowers. That's all you ever do. And then you just get asked for flowers. And then one day you're like, you know, I kind of don't want to do flowers anymore. And you like try to leave it. And people are like, no, <laughs> you know? so, like, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to like, um, put myself into like a box where I only ever do one thing. And I only ever have like one set of like ideas that I work in. And so when, you know, when people like, cause I've done a couple Medusa tattoos, like more than one and stuff like that. But it's like, like how many times have you been asked to do, you know, St. Michael versus the devil? Mm. It's, you know, and because right. of the internet, because these ideas keep getting recycled, they keep getting asked for. And I just was like, how about I introduce some ideas that you haven't thought of, you know, or that you haven't seen because nobody's asked for it and nobody's done it. So there's nothing out there to like previously like influence you into it, but it's cool shit that like nobody thinks about because they just aren't fed it every day, you know? Right. Um, right. And I love mythology and I love, you know, all kinds of stuff like, uh, you know, anime stuff, mythology stuff, fantasy novels, uh, sci-fi stuff like I get into so many different things that have like inspired me since I was a kid that new stuff that's getting to me now like uh, and I want to be able to work on that stuff I want to be able to like explore those ideas and I want to be able to take those characters and draw them the way that I want to draw them or tell that story visually if it's never been told visually um, and so that's kind of what like sparked that idea of like well why don't I just make a list why don't I just say like because the other thing was I, I did start drawing stuff. I, I like sat down once and I was like, okay, I'm going to draw an alien leg sleeve. I've got a great idea for it. And I drew the whole thing out and I really you know, committed to it. But it took so long because when there's no deadline, you just keep changing it and keep adding to it, keep moving this and change that and do this. And, and so like I had so much time in this drawing and I can only do that tattoo once. So as like, I'm you now I'm happy with the drawing, but it's like, how is it that I can get other tattoo drawings done in like two or three days, but this one took me like two weeks, you know? Yeah. Uh, that, that was going to be one of, one of my questions is uh, I understand the, the desire to, to make that kind of transition. And I feel like that there's like, um, the idea is, especially when, when someone has you know, kind of reached a, a level in tattooing, uh, both from a skill standpoint and from like uh, a, a popularity standpoint that, that you have, that you can kind of, that you could create those things and create them around like common themes that people can relate to, where it's like, well, this is kind of a story of overcoming struggle or whatever. And everyone's like, oh yeah, I've done that, you know? And so you can kind of like, you can relate it to something personal for them. But to me, it seems like the, the biggest challenge, like on the front end is just being able to make the time to make the drawings whenever you're drawing for tattoos all the time. So that kind of answers yeah. that to an extent. Yeah. yeah. So that, like I had done it a couple of times where I like drew up an entire piece and then like put it out there and got, you know, uh, like 50 emails for this one drawing. And it's like, I got to pick one person out of 50 people to give this to. And that was like overwhelming, you know, and also like, it's like, who am I to, to decide <laughs> who gets this drawing? Like it was, it, it was really like, I didn't like that feeling, you know, I didn't like that pressure of like picking, you know, and so I tried to do it on like a first come first serve thing, which is also difficult sometimes because like the first person might be like, yeah, but they want it like this big. And you're like, no, it's a leg sleeve. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, and then the second person's like, yeah, I'm down. Like, what is it like a thousand dollars? And you're like, no, it's a leg sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, I didn't even think about. Yeah. yeah, I didn't even think about that. So, have you found that's got to be a? Have you found a solution to that problem? Yeah. So, to solve both of those problems, where the issue where I'm drawing, you know, I'm spending all this time on something, um, to not don't draw it. You know, like if you have a thumbnail because like you were doodling in a sketchbook, great. But like, leave it as a thumbnail. You don't have to show anybody that. Like, the best thing that has worked for me is to just have a list. And it's just a description of what I want to do. And it it's like semi-specific because I, I pick very specific characters. Like if I go to Greek mythology, I'm like, I want to do Melano. She's the goddess of ghosts. Look it up. 
you know, like you do the research, but like, I want to do her or I want to do Poseidon or I want to do, you know, the main character from, you know, devil man cry baby, or I want to do, you know, the main character from Van Helsing, you know, it's like, you have to be specific because if you just go, I want to do flowers, that could mean any flower. And when you, when you say, I want to do more floral stuff, then you get people that are like, cool. How about carnations? And you're like, I fucking hate carnations. (laughs) It's the worst flower, Um, you know, but uh, so like being specific, have a list, limit it, you know, like only have like 20 things that you want to do because are you going to be able to take on 20 projects like right away? Probably not. And let's assume that like only 75% of those ideas are like resonate with somebody. And then from there, it's like, you know, I might get like four or five people for this one and like three or four people for this one and two people for this one and one person for this one, you know, and then instead of having to go through like 20 people for one idea, I just have to go to the first of the four people that are like really into that idea. Yeah. 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 That, that answers a question that I, that I had, uh, thought of earlier and that was not thinking that you didn't create the designs on the front end. And now that you mentioned that, I think I've actually seen uh, that list you've put out before, like these are the projects I would like to do next year. Uh, I was thinking if you were like, for example, the alien piece that you put so much time into, there was supposed to be a leg sleeve. If, if the perfect client actually wanted it as a back piece, it really changes a lot. And especially not knowing like, who that client is, what's their complexion, what's their, I mean, all types of things about the person that completely changed the approach, right? Yeah. And so that's also part of like a a booking process that I go through and it's not like quick and easy. Like there's people get like, I call it my list of demands because it's essentially like, here's what you got to be willing to do to get this tattoo. And it involves the pricing. Like I'm very upfront about pricing and time. Like I'm pretty, spot on with about how many sessions it's going to take me to finish something unless that person's just like you know six foot seven or something like that where they're just like tall as fuck and you're like shit i didn't know your leg was the size of my body you know like (laughs) but uh yeah so it's like i always hit on price i always hit on like amount of sessions it's going to take and then you know i usually try to like really get an idea of like what they've got going on already because the issue that you run into when you're working on larger pieces is people already having tattoos. Like that's like more so like I could give a fuck about skin color or any of the other shit, but it's like, like scars don't bother me, you know, anything like that. I can work around any of that shit. But if you've got a tattoo that's in the fucking middle of your back and you want a back piece, like, <laughs> right, no, right. <laughs> yeah, like we got to talk about that, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm willing to do cover-ups and I'm willing to work with, you know, stuff like that. But like, I had, I had somebody that emailed in and they're like, yeah, I really want to get that idea that you have written up for a back piece. And I'm like, cool, before you can book, I need a picture of your back, mm-hmm. like neck to knees, you know, you can leave your underwear on unless there's a tattoo there that I need to know about, like send it to me. And then, and then they do. And it's like, I had one dude that had like lettering across the top of his back and like stuff on the bottom. And then like his ribs were already filled in. And I was like, literally like an eight by 10 piece of paper. And I was like, no, like it doesn't work. Even though I haven't drawn this design yet, I have an idea of how I want it to go. And there's just not enough space. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, yeah, that's, um, yeah, all that stuff makes perfect sense. Look, let's, uh, let me jump back to the actual kind of design pro- or even before the di- design process, whenever just your process a- a- as it starts. I always, uh, the thing that I've started to notice talking to really great tattooers and just, and just being around them over the, over the years of doing the show is that the thing that tends to separate really great tattooers from, from most of the other folks that I, that I talk to is that they're, process is pretty well defined and if they do start to like step out or as they start to expand and get and get better they always kind of have that base that they know they can fall back on and they know what will work and 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 nick and i were just talking about this kind of thing and how he's changed his approach a little bit the last few years work because he's you know working on more texas clients that are in the sun more and so he's become more kind of like traditional in his approach uh, bolder lines where he used to not be much uh, you know for doing lines and things like that so um 
so I've, I, I'd like to focus a little bit on this episode, just on the pro, uh, on this whole series, just on like the processes from the start. So are your, when you start to think of an idea, obviously you don't have a client in mind, or maybe you do, but you it's, there's no client in, 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 at the start. Uh, are you kind of taking a lot of myths and things that you're into literally and, and trying to find your own way to present a story that exists? Are you creating a lot of hybrids? Are you kind of like, t- like how much liberty are you taking with the, with the narrative on the front end before you even start drawing? It depends on the subject. Um, certain things like Greek mythology, there's a lot of information and a lot of contradicting stories and there and obviously those characters are involved in multiple stories across that like mythology so like there's a story where Zeus turns into a swan and there's a story where he turns into an eagle and there's a story where he t- you know it's like you know he, he does a bunch of different things so really when you have something like that it's like well what part of his story do you want to tell um, and a lot of times with the Greek mythology stuff what I really get into is the symbolic ideas that are attached to them so um like if they're the goddess of you know a certain uh like the ghost one it's like okay so she's the goddess of ghosts and madness and you know insanity and so it's like how can i take that and embody it in a person and then what kind of you know place would she inhabit because there's not like i tried to choose like i'll have one or two that are like very recognizable ideas that's like okay they've definitely heard of this person in greek mythology they're very popular um but then like she was one where it's like you probably haven't read about her you probably haven't like she's not in a lot of like the mainstream cultural you know like movies or tv shows or anything like that so then you really kind of have to build that entire character um because there's not a lot to go off of you you literally have to kind of do some digging on the internet find enough things that kind of check out and, you know, multiple times where you're like, okay, they keep saying this, they keep saying this, they keep saying, so I'm going to work with that, you know? And so for her, it's like, sky's the limit. I can kind of go whichever way I want with that. But then when I work with like an anime, that's a pretty dialed in character already with a pretty dialed in setting and background. And so like, in that case, you're really just kind of picking like, what setting of the movie or the series that they were in that you want to work with, what characters, what accessories, what outfits, you know? So in that sense, I don't feel like I'm getting to tell like as much of a different story. I'm just telling that story, but I'm just doing it in tattoo form, you know, like, and the one thing I I really try to stay away from is any kind of like absolute representation from the film or the movie or, or the comic book or anything like that. I don't want to do anything that looks too much like the comic book or too much like the movie. I want it to still read as my artwork. So like drawing it all from hand, not you know, there's no tracing. There's no like pulling things and like trying to, you know, work it into a piece. I don't do any of that. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So whenever, so what do you, well, I'll back up again. When you're when you're creating these like narrative, whether you're telling a literal story or whether you're taking like some liberties or whatever with it, are you like a list maker? Are you making physical lists of like, all right, this is kind of what I see. Like I'm establishing a hierarchy here. This these are the kind of uh, symbols that I think I would like to use or that would make sense with this. This is the basic setting. Um, I think the background's dark and the foreground's light, or vice versa. Or are, are you like making physical lists like that early on? Yeah, sometimes I do. Like if I, especially if I'm struggling with what else to put in with that character, I will start writing down just things. And it's like, okay, let's do some moths and let's do some mushrooms and let's do, you know, veil and let's do a, you know, torch. And like, I'll start writing those things in. I might not include all of them, you know, or I might just like pick three and really like focus on those three things. Um, But yeah, definitely. I think list making is super helpful uh, when you're just like doing that idea generating moment before you really have committed to anything, because it, a lot of times I feel like you can get really wrapped up in the, in the figure or the main character. And then the rest of it just kind of is, meh, you know? Yeah. That's, I'm glad you brought that up. We, I think that's a, you know, an easy thing to kind of like, um, you know, you're establishing whatever a hierarchy and you, and you focus so much on the main, 
know, the main figure or the main shapes or whatever they are. And, um, and I think I've made that mistake a lot over the years of getting too focused. I like, I like to simplify the process a lot. And sometimes by simplifying, I may oversimplify. And there are things that I could add that would have, that have been valuable. And, and I left them out just, just trying to dumb it down. And I was doing a, um, I, I'm sure, you know, Andy Chambers who work, who works near you up there, but he, yeah. I was talking um, to him or actually we did a little workshop together, a total workshop together. And he talked about how he likes to find something uh, in each piece that, that makes that piece like um, exceptional to him, whether or not the client realizes that's what makes it exceptional is, is, is secondary to him. But he like, like to me, I want this little nugget in there or that little nugget, or that's the piece that, or that's the little thing that changed that tattoo for me that made it was something that I was like, that went from a good tattoo to something that, that I'll always remember. Uh, and I think that's one of those, that's like that extra level of thought that a lot of people probably don't put in. Yeah. I think in tattooing, a lot of that has to do with creating a, a completed piece, you know, like you have to really consider your backgrounds. And I think in tattooing, a lot of people don't, a lot of people, and it's hard to, cause in certain styles, there really isn't a call for that. Like in traditional tattooing, there's really not a call for background. Um, you know, or like, man, like a watercolor tattoo. It's like the background is the watercolor, you know, but like when you're doing illustrative stuff, especially, I think if you want to be, if you want to make something that's different, that's like going to stand out against all the other illustrative tattoos that are out there, it really is an attention to a background and not just like a fade out of black or a fade out of some color or something like that. But ever, even when I was doing smaller tattoos, I always was like, okay, now what do I put in this background here? Because it's like, you know, that person's going to get other tattoos, right? Right. What's going to go up against that tattoo? If you haven't included some kind of like atmospheric, like this is where it exists. Like, what are they supposed to build off of that? And you know, even if I'm not the next person doing the tattoo, I want there to be an option for that next artist to like bring their tattoo right up next to it and fade into it and work with it. Uh, so that was always something that I've always considered, even when I was doing smaller tattoos. And then when I started doing larger tattoos, sometimes those like little background elements really sell the story because again, like the main character is the main character, sure. And then if they look cool and they're pretty and they, you know, it's a nice tattoo, great. But like, if you, if you are thinking about those little foreground background elements, it really just takes everything to that next level. You know, it's like, it's like a piece of like food. It's like you put a steak on a plate. It's a good steak. But if you add those mashed potatoes and a nice little drizzle of sauce, it feels like you're at a fancy restaurant. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. 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 Perfect. Yeah. It's great analogy. <laughs> That's, you know, you, you think about like how many, um, landscape painters uh, create these these like environments. It, like thinking of storytelling without it being an actual story. And you think a really great like plain air painter that can that can lay something out and capture you know a, a part of a day really quickly and and really effectively so that you feel like you like know what, what he like what was happening right there at that point in time. And that's something in tat more difficult to pull off in tattooing, but the concept could be there, like where you. Uh, where like that background could really tell you a lot more about the story than you probably think it could. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And I, I think a lot of times my clients appreciate sometimes those little details more than the main character at the end. Like they're like, Oh, I didn't realize you worked this in to this little weird corner. And it's like, well, yeah, you know, and I think people also get kind of wrapped up on, um, everything being on this like visible plane, you know, they're like, well, I want all the cool stuff to be here and like here on that outside edge where everybody's going to see it. And then like the inside, nobody really like works that hard at it. They just kind of like wrap it and they're like, well, whatever falls on the inside, that's on the inside. And it's like, yeah, but think about that. Like that should be cool too. Like whatever's going on the inside of that arm or on the inside of that forearm needs to be just as cool as what's on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Just little bits, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's something that yeah, I completely agree. A lot of times you don't think the one thing I try to pay attention to so much when my clients are coming in, like you, I, I worked on this one piece a day and I'm in a, in a space with a nice kitchen, full refrigerator. So when my clients walk in, they have lunch, they have all their stuff, you know, they're used to it. And so as they're walking in and we're talking and I'm asking about their life since I last saw them and they're putting their food in the refrigerator and they're opening a bottle of water, I'm always like glancing at the tattoo 
to see every possible kind of angle that I might experience it from. And it's like, man, there's really nothing cool happening whenever he's opening that water through there. Like, hmm, mm-hmm. that was a mistake. I wonder what I can do to correct that. I think it's like always kind of like trying to, I do it in glances. You know what I mean? I don't want to like sit and study it. I want to like, I want something to be interesting at each area at a, at a glance. And I think that's something that's so easy to, to over, overlook or. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because you're, you're only thinking about, and when you, you know, stand up to look at your stencil on them again, like you're mostly just looking at the outside of that arm. You're not thinking about like when they turn away from you and they walk away, what's on the back of the arm, you know? And when they open their arm up to go point at something like what's on the inside, you know, like mm-hmm. all of those things do play a part. And, you know, that's, it's a, a thing that I try to like, you know, even in the artists that work with me, I'm like, what are you going to do here? You know, what are you going to do here? Like, mm-hmm. and if you, and if you don't have it figured out, like if you're, if you've planned out this sleeve, and turns out you didn't figure out enough. And so there's like a blank spot on the inside of the arm or something. Don't feel like you have to do it today. You know, like that's the other thing is I think a lot of people will try to rush and get this whole thing like sorted and there's like frazzled because they want to have this completed idea. But sometimes going home and thinking about it, you come back with something better and you can always trace those spaces. You can always like, you know, once you get the stencil on there, figure out where your shapes are you know, don't hardline everything if you're not a hundred percent sold on it. And then like, you know, come back to it later. Like you're going to see them for like six more sessions. You know, like yeah. <laughs> you've got time. <laughs> and there's nothing worse than rushing it and then having to look at that decision for six more sessions being like, ah, yeah. I wish I hadn't done that. Yeah. Like why yeah. did I rush this? Why didn't I just take this home and draw it? You know, what was the, what was, the hurry to get this done and get this on there and it's not my best one you know i could have done that thing better um and that i mean it still happens to me sometimes because i'm like no no no, i got it i got it and then later on i'm like "Eh, it could have probably been better you know right right uh before because a lot of people who who watch this well obviously most of them will not be creating designs and, and selling them to clients whenever you were using the client's input more uh, you know, are, are building these uh, narratives off of the client's stories. Were, were there a lot of things different about your process then, or is it, was it pretty similar? Uh, did, did you find also, it, it, part of the same question, I guess, is um, you were, you know, already kind of probably known for certain element things, birds, wings, whatever it was. Did you find that like, uh, that you were limited by the client's expectations a lot of times with their stories. Like I want to tell a story about my wife or kids or whoever, but I loved that Phoenix or I loved whatever. And I'd like to do a wing across here. Like, uh, do you deal with a lot of that? I, I mean, I definitely had people that brought me a lot of recycled ideas, you know, stuff that I was just like, really this again, I think like for like, And I've told people this a million times, but like, I fucking hate hummingbirds now. Like I love them in real life. They're cool outside, but like, don't ask me for hummingbird tattoo. Cause like I have done so many hummingbirds for people's grandmas. And I don't even know if grandmas really like hummingbirds, but like, that's the story that I've been sold on. So like, like, I have a drawer full of sketches of just hummingbirds. Uh, and they are the most boring bird to draw because they only come in that one like wing back, like, you know, <laughs> it's like, that's it. That's all anybody ever wants. Uh, I don't, I don't know how people can keep tattooing those guys. Cause I I'm over it, but, uh, and same, same with like certain flowers. I'm just, I'm done with them. But, uh, yeah, yeah it's like, I, I definitely, I think flowers was something that I got roped into a lot because everybody wants to use the birth flowers to describe their families. Uh, and not that that's like a terrible idea or anything. It's just, I did it so much that I started hating flowers. And then I also like noticed that anytime a, a tattoo artist wasn't sure what to do with something, they would just put a flower in there. They were like, oh, I got this really cool idea and I don't know how to end it. So I guess I'll put a rose here, you know? And it had like nothing to do with anything else in the in the storyline. It was just like, eh, flowers, you know, and it's always a rose or a skull or something like that. So like, um, that was one thing I really like challenged myself to just stop doing. And so a lot of my tattoos, you will not see flowers in like a lot of my sleeves and back pieces and things like that. You just won't see a fucking flower in it because I'm 
I'm done. I'm over it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah. We can find something cooler. I promise. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that, that's kind of, that's, I guess that is kind of the question is like, what, what have, what's, what's been success or what successful approaches have you had for like uh, talking clients out of the most obvious solution to the problem? You know what I mean? Or like, yeah. 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 So a lot of times it's, it's just having a cooler idea than them. You know, mm-hmm. if you, if you already know that, like, if you, if you're really well read on certain subjects, you're going to have a better idea anyways. So when somebody brings you something that you've, you've done it over and over and over again, if you've done the research, you already know the other cool things that can go in there. Um, and so it's just, a, it's just a matter of kind of doing, a, doing the work on the back end and being like, look, I know that we talked about this, but what do you think about this? You know, like, I think it'll be really cool. I think it goes better with the story. I think, you know, it kind of completes the image more, you know, it's having that kind of conversation with somebody, you know, and being, being really confident about what you're saying, you know, like really come at them with like, this is going to be great. You're going to love it. You know, I'm so excited for it. And a lot of times you can sell somebody just on that confidence, but with reason because there's also that whole like I don't want to give somebody a tattoo they don't want so if they're really 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 pushing for this one thing you gotta do it um other things that really helped me with with clients that had a lot of demands though was making them list it I'd be like okay make a list of all the things you want now we don't have enough room to do all those things so pick your top three And a lot of times, like all the bullshit gets filtered out, you know, because that's, I think the biggest problem when you're working in smaller pieces is everybody wants to try and fit like 10 different things in there to represent all these different things. And you're like, I know that's what you want, but this tattoo can't be that big. So if we're going to work this big, pick three, pick three things, you know, and that I think really helps people kind of get rid of some stuff. It helps you kind of see where their mind is. Cause that's the other thing is I think clients also like they'll bring you this list, but they don't tell you anything about what's important in it. And so then you go and draw this thing and you went with the the thing that you thought was the coolest. And it turns out that was the thing they wanted the least Mm -hmm. out of the 10 or 20 things that they said, I could be cool with this or this or this or this. And then you draw them, uh, you know, three of the 20 things they gave you. And they're like, Oh, I didn't want any of those things. And you're like, how did this happen? And it's like, you just gotta like have them rank it. It's like, number one is a rose. Number two is a skull. Number three is a hummingbird. <laughs> and you're like, damn it. None of the things I want. You picked all the ones I didn't want to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, com- I completely, uh, I completely agree. And I, I think that, you know, the big problem is, especially people who aren't uh, already heavily tattooed, they think that they need, you know, this is going to be their only tattoo. So they need to get the cornucopia of things that they ever wanted and that represent everyone that they ever loved in this, in this one kind of piece. Uh, I do the exact same thing. I just say like, all right, let's narrow it down to the top. Like, let's like, let's rank these in order of importance. And then um, one thing that, that I think is, is pretty useful is like, I'll say like, you know, we could do like five of those things in in that space. It's not going to be interesting. It's going to be cluttered. No one's going to care because from five feet away, the tattoo is going to look like some some tattoo. Uh, But or we could like simplify this, make a really interesting arrangement of shapes that like strike people from a distance and they'll come up and ask you about the tattoo. And then you can tell them all of the significance. Also, I would really like to see somebody do a cornucopia with just a bunch of stuff coming out of it. I think that would be an amazing tattoo. That would be. <laughs> like yeah. Filling down their arm, like everything they ever asked. Right. Oh my God, that'd be great. Yeah, 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 just all of the most common everything. Yeah, yeah. great, great yeah, idea. Yeah, please. Somebody, somebody who's watching this video needs to do that and then they need to tag me in it and I will reshare it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, hummingbirds and roses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, um, like I said, I don't have any structure to at all to this series, but I did ask Nick if he, if there was a particular, because one thing I do want to do that I'm, I'm so, like I mentioned earlier, I'm so sick of these Zoom conversations where it's just our two heads <laughs> back and forth. So I'm trying to add a little production value to them and like drop in whatever I can scrape together. So is there any, is there a piece that you think would be, uh, a good example, whether it's an old piece that really like 
changed your approach or you solved an interesting problem from a storytelling standpoint or something recent or in progress that you might be able to tell the story of and I can drop in the footage of over the story? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So not even that long ago, I think it was January we started this project, but I really wanted to do a female werewolf uh, because like you get a lot of like male dude werewolves, but you don't get a lot of chick werewolves. And I was like, yeah. that would be fun. <laughs> Um, so I had done like a small one, like a really small drawing of something like that way back when I was doing my little commission sketches during the shutdown. And so that was kind of like, Ooh, this would be a cool tattoo. Maybe as like, you know, a sleeve or something. Um, and I would redraw it because what I did on paper isn't going to work for a tattoo, but uh, I had somebody book it and they were like, well, can we make it into a back piece? And I was like, sure. Why not? Um, but that storyline, so like it starts off like I just wanted to do like just a female werewolf, just something that was feminine, but also like brutal and, you know, dark and, you know, that whole horror theme kind of idea. Uh, but as we went along, like as I started drawing it, like because I didn't want to do the same thing I'd already done on paper. And so I'm trying to like figure out like what pose is she going to inhabit? What's she doing? Like, is, is this a curse? Is this is she cool with it? Is it bad? Is it good? Is it a struggle? Is it a fight? Is it accepted? Is it, you know, celebrated? Like what is happening in this tattoo? Like, what am I going for with this? And, um, I kind of like, I'll, I'll have like some model pictures that I follow on Instagram and I was working from one of those. And it was just like a girl that kind of had like a big giant hood on and she's kind of like holding it. So I kind of use that as like an inspiration for it. And I drew the werewolf kind of holding the hood up like around her head. And then like her body kind of got more curvy as I started drawing it and really like feminine. But then I was like, oh, this hood, oh, let's do like Red Riding Hood. But Red Riding Hood's the wolf and not a little girl. She's like a grown ass woman, but she's also a beast. Right. And so then it turns into that storyline. And then at one point I was really struggling to figure out what to put, cause it's a big back piece. It's like neck to, thighs like back of the thighs so it's pretty big um and I was trying to figure out what else to work in to background because again background is super important to me and like an, an easy one was moonflowers because they bloom at night they're called fucking moonflowers <laughs> works great with a werewolf you know yeah. and so that's like an easy one it's like okay I can have that kind of coming in like swirling this way but I couldn't figure out what to put in like the bottom right corner of the design and it was just like killing me. And eventually I like went back and I fucking like reread the Little Red Riding Hood stories, which is obviously a short read, easy. A little bit of research goes a long way because I'm like, oh, right, the wolf gets killed by the fucking ax guy. Like at the end of the story, uh. the woodcutter shows up at the cottage, kills the wolf, rips it open, releases grandma and Little Red Riding Hood from the contents of his stomach. And I was like, well, but this is the, this is the wolf. So how can I work this in? So I have her holding the ax. Mm. So instead yeah. of the ax, you know, the woodcutter coming in and destroying the wolf, the, the female werewolf is like, fucking try me, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. So she, she's rocking the ax at the end of the story. And, you know, the, the more I like, got into this, the more I just really liked the idea of, uh, just like this female positive strength story where because little red riding hood is like a lot like she's lost she's innocent she's naive she does she buys into everything she like gets eaten in the end like she's just totally you know poor poor little girl can't take care of herself you know and in this story it's like no 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 poor little woodcutter didn't listen you know like yeah, <laughs> should have yeah. stayed away from the wolf you know um so just kind of like a female empowerment like switch of the storyline instead of you know just like a, a lost and you know naive yeah. young girl it's like a grown us grown up like female werewolf just prowling the woods at night not afraid doing her thing you know um and just like really nice like really strong and so i really liked the way that that kind of 
story arced into this finished product and I'm really excited to, to finish it. We've only done, I think, two days on it. So it's still in the very, very beginning stages of being tattooed, but the, you know, the drawing was completed and, and put on there. And I think I have a picture of it up on my Instagram, but yeah, it was, it was super fun. And the client, I mean, again, like the only title that the client read was female werewolf. So she had no idea when she came in to get the tattoo, what was going to be presented to her. She had hoped, you know, obviously a female werewolf was going to be the main character, but we didn't talk about storyline. We didn't talk about whether it was going to be like an angry wolf or a, you know, a sexy wolf or, a, you know, it's just like, we had no, no talks prior to her coming in. And so. Yeah. That, that's, yeah. I, and I, I, that's like, it's comforting to see that, uh, like that the idea was able to like evolve throughout the process and it wasn't like completely fleshed out. I think a lot of people, are you know would be intimidated to um uh to start a piece for a client that had already like committed to the piece without having it completely like flushed out and like all right this is the story these are all the elements and like i, I like how that kind of comes together as you you know because there's a blank space on her body that you're like well i have to do something with that space and then that completely affects like the arc of the story or the you know the the meaning yeah. like, right yeah, like it completely changed the meaning of the story, whereas before it's kind of this just like feminine wolf, you know, very like beautiful, but like not tortured, not really, not really feeling a lot of feelings in the in the thing to like now she's carrying a weapon. So that really changes the dynamic of that entire story to like, oh, it's not just this wolf female character in the woods. This is like, she's got a purpose, like she's either gonna go kill somebody or is defending herself or you know who knows but like it really adds like a whole different layer to it uh that just wasn't there without that and you know personally i just i love it when a when a piece can kind of just like take this whole journey you know and i and i'm i'm along for the ride like i'm just kind of going with it and i'm like fuck this is great <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah it's so fun and it's what's great is like i think because I've done this for a few years now, my clients are kind of coming in just like ready for anything. Like they mm -hmm. they don't know what they're gonna get. They know that there's certain possibilities. Could be nudity, could not be. Who knows? Like, but they're always game. Like I haven't had anybody that's walked in that's been like, ooh, yeah, I wasn't I'm not into that. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. What one last thing? And I know we're, we're getting close. I don't want to keep you all night. But what, one last uh, thing? How important? Is it outside of you and, and the client for the for the end piece? How important is it for whatever the story, the narrative that you had created, uh, to be like easily rec or to be recognized by the viewer? Like, are you okay with the viewer kind of creating their own story based off of it? Do you what, do you prefer that they understand what it was about to you? No, I I have no. Uh... I have no feelings about that. If, if somebody just sees it and it creates a narrative for them, fantastic. You know, I think that's the best, that's the best thing you can do. Um, because the whole point of it is like, the, I might have my own personal attachment to it and my own like thoughts about it and what it means to me and what I drew, but like other people are going to resonate to those images and stuff in different ways. And, you know, some people might find it very threatening, like that whole werewolf situation. They might be like, not, into that you know and and that's fine if that's where they're at with it um you know or they might just go a completely different way <laughs> like and to them it's like a horror movie you know it's like great cool you know like i'm i'm into whatever comes of it you know as long as it's not like super you know horrible for my client <laughs> to deal with because that's i think the person that wears it is the person that has to deal with that narrative you know because that's they're the ones that are going to get stopped on the street or at the beach or whatever and they're going to have that person that wants to talk about that tattoo so right, uh right. more so for them i'm like man i hope this works out for you <laughs> yeah yeah and that's that's the difference i guess between like a gallery show and what people get out of your you know fine art or paintings and what people get out of uh out of the tattoos that you're putting on other people uh that's uh yeah, yeah completely different yeah. Well, um, uh, thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. I love uh, that. That was that was awesome. I hope the whole series goes that way. You guys, but you and I've only done two so far, but you and Nick both shared like different kind of nuggets that I think are really good. Did I see that you guys? Uh, did I see there's a new um, uh, an Explorer conference coming yeah. up? 
Yeah, we yeah. are doing Explorer in Dallas this year. I believe it's September 6th to the 8th. Um, I'm going to be presenting at it. I'm going to actually do a smaller tattoo to present on because I've done in the past, I've done some uh, stuff about large scale tattooing and, and go more in depth on the process of how I create this stuff and whatnot with lots and lots of examples. Um, but this time it'll be focused more on like, if you're doing a one shot piece or a two day piece, like here's how I work that, which, you know, it's not that different from the larger stuff. It's just, you'll actually get to see some tattooing videos and things like that too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sweet. That's awesome. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll link to, to that as well. I, I have not been to one of those uh, yet, but I'd love to do one. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We have a, we have a really cool lineup this time too. I think Heather McLean from Canada is coming down Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, as somebody who does like illustrative tattooing. She is fantastic in those okay. regards because she does a lot of storytelling in her work that is just completely original like to her like she doesn't really work from a lot of outside influence as far as like recognizable things from like movies or tv shows or anything like that it's all kind of like her and the client having a conversation and then she creates this whole storyline of this stuff that she puts on them and it is fantastic so i would, cannot would, wait to hear her talk would she be someone that would be good for this series, oh, you think? Absolutely. Reach out. I'll reach yeah. out. I'm not, I, I recognize her name, but I, I can't picture her work. I'll, I'll look her up and reach out. Yeah, I'll, I'll tag you in her stuff and okay. uh, get you some hookups for that. But yeah, she's fantastic. Sweet. Awesome. Awesome. Well, sweet. Thanks. I hope we can do this in person. I've enjoyed both conversations so much. So I hope we can do this yeah. again in person someday. Yeah. But, uh, one day. Now that COVID's one day. <laughs> sweet. Thank you. Have a good week. All right. I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye. All right, bye. Hey, thanks again for watching. If you haven't already, we ask that you would subscribe to our channel so you can stay up to date with new episodes. Also, if you've gotten any value out of our show at all, we would be honored if you would buy us a beer at our Patreon link. And uh, finally, if you'd like to visit our website and sign up for our newsletter, you can find out where we are going, if we're going to be in a town near you, maybe tatting at a convention or something like that. And uh, while you're there, you can pick up some fireside merchandise like a new t-shirt or a hoodie or a coffee mug. Thanks again.